Okay. Hi everyone. Um, this is uh, let's discuss a paper right after reading it. Um, in this journal craft, we selected uh, started uh, reading paper um, two hours ago, and then from now on, we are going to discuss the paper. Today, uh, we have Chan Shen and me. Chan Shen, can you introduce yourself? Uh, yes. Hello, everyone. My name is Chen Chen, and I'm currently a PhD student at uh, Monash University in Australia. Hey, thank you, Chen Shen. I'm me, uh, Yota Kawashima. I'm a research assistant in, in Japan. Okay. So today, we are going to discuss a paper titled Activation of Human Visual Area V6 During Egocentric Navigation with and Without Visual Experience. And this paper is by um, Ag 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 Agus Vela et al. Um, 2023, um, Current Biology. Before starting the discussion, first I'll give you just a quick summary of this paper. Okay, so as the title says, this is a paper investigate the um, eco egocentric navigation. And first of all, um, this paper, they said that visual information is very important for spatial tasks and navigation. And this visual information is also uh, important for the development of spatial abilities. Um, given previous uh, other research and findings, they uh, propose or hypothesize that V1, uh, visual area V, uh, not V1, sorry, uh, the visual area V6 um, may be uh, important for this egocentric visual navigation. Um, there are a couple of reasons. Um, for example, uh, it integrates eye movement and retinal signals. So it's uh, activate. It's known as a motion area, and also it's connected to a uh, parahippocampal uh, place area, something like that. And based on these findings, they hypothesize that uh, this V six is important for egocentric visual navigations. And first question of this paper is then, uh, is this hypothesis is true? So this is the first question. And also they ask another uh, question, which is, okay, uh, so this function in V6 um, navigation um, can be uh, developed without um, visual experience because uh, some congenitally blind people, so blind uh, from their past, uh, can perform still spatial, some spatial tasks. And this may suggest that, you know, in order to have spatial um, ability, maybe uh, we don't need the visual experiences. So they also, answer this question, ask this question in their paradigm. So the second question is that, is visual experience necessary for navigation function in V6? And finally, they also, uh, lastly, yeah, they also another ask another question, which is uh, as visual uh, navigation is related to uh, body movement because uh, the space is all based on uh, the relation with your body partitions. So they also check whether this V6 is related to body movement or not. And these are three questions uh, answered in these papers, but how they did that. So basically uh, they used um, virtual maze um, experiment. And during the virtual maze experiment, they uh, scanned the brain activity, so MRI imaging, uh, MRI. So the first, to answer the first questions, and um, they just, you know, compared the two task conditions, the navigation condition and control conditions where um, sighted participants can uh, navigate in the 
in the virtual maze and check whether there are any activity in B6 or the activity is higher in uh, task condition than in control conditions. And also in order to answer the second question, is visual experience necessary for navigation function in B6? Uh, they compare the activity or they uh, record the activity from sighted participant and also the congenitally uh, blind participants. And again, um, this um, blind participants, uh, they uh, first, um, before the scanning, try the uh, navigation task, but of course, uh, they need some device to measure the spatial uh, distance. And that is done by uh, some device called IK. And this device just uh, works um, if the sensor detects something, some object far away from the participant, uh, it sounds low, uh, it makes low sounds. Then if it close, then it makes high sound, I think. Then based on that participant can measure the distance. And they compare the brain activity in B6 before and after uh, training. And they found that activation is stronger after the, uh, after the trainings. And this suggests that this uh, V6 is uh, still activate without visual experience. And lastly, uh, they ask whether V6 responds to body movement or not. And for this, um, question, they, or this study recruit participants and just cited participant, ask them to move their body within MRI scanner and see which brain region activate when, which body part they move. And then they found that uh, the six also activate. Uh, mainly when participant move head and upper body part. Um, yeah, that's basically it. And um, again, the summary of this paper is that uh, the, this V6 may be or, or may be important for uh, this navigation or encode some information for navigation. And this function does not require visual experience to be developed. That's the main findings of this paper. Um, that's my summary. And Chanshen, do you have anything to add? Um, no, I think your summary is pretty good. Okay, so sh shall we start a uh, discussion then? Do you have anything to say? Question, um, comments? Maybe, maybe start from yours because mine's relatively um, kind of specific and less related to this without visual experience part. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, so first of all, when I read this paper, I um, kind of remember someone, I think now he mentioned some another paper saying that, you know, we, you know, call the visual area as visual area, but some researcher claims that that's not visual area, it's spatial area or something like that. Do you remember this? So mm -hmm. for example, B1 is known to, you know, encode the visual information, but it may not be true. Of course, it, the, the, you know, visual area encode visual information, but you know, the essence is not the vision, rather it's spatial thing. That's the frame of some research, but I forgot uh, who said that, so, but you know, anyway, that's, you know, what I, you know, thought or remembered during reading this paper, because again, this paper talking about uh, activity in 
D6 visual, you know, area. But it says that, you know, spatial information, um, not spatial, but uh, the navigation function does not require the visual experience to be developed. Yeah, that also reminds me. Yeah. yeah. That also reminds me of the Westlin et al's paper that we um, did journal club for uh, probably a month ago. Mm -hmm. It also mentions that visual tortoises can also process all the three cues. So mm -hmm. there's some level of um, neural plasticity there. Mm -hmm. And maybe they are all dedicated to, you know, ultimately to represent the space around you. Mm -hmm. So um, in a sense, it's kind of whatever works mm -hmm. in that situation. Mm. And um, recently on Twitter, I also saw someone mention that it's all motor cortices or something like that. You know, it's all about motion and it's nothing <laughs> to do with visual or something. <laughs> but I didn't read carefully into it. Mm. See. But uh, it may be related mm. in this sense, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's just, you know, the only, you know, main comment I have. Of course, I have several, you know, minor points, but... Um, My point also is minor, but... Um, uh, This this may be you know slightly off topic, but um, my interpretation of this finding <clears throat> is that V six is um very important for constructing a subjective point of view, mm. at least in the you know specific context. In this, it helps people who are critically blind to um create a subjective point of view to the space in that maze, right? Mm. And that actually reminds me of uh, Taguchi-san's presentation in Qualia Structure, where he says, any conscious experience has to have a body that anchors your um, subjective point of view, mm. right? Um, you know, whenever you're conscious of something, it must be with reference to your own body. Mm. In that sense, physics seems to be very important as you know, part of um, the um, how do I say this? It's, it's one of the mechanism for for consciousness. Maybe I see. Mm, yeah, might be interesting if or what happen if we dysfunction this yeah. you know, <laughs> navigation stuff. Maybe our experience just you know. Even, yeah, it's hard to imagine what it would be like. Mm -hmm. um, but um, one thing I, I actually uh, thought of was, you know, during psychedelic experience, you have a expanded sense of self. Mm -hmm. Somehow, like, people would think that, oh, the, the, the table they're sitting in front of is part of their mm -hmm. own body as well. So I'm not sure, you know, it... it it may happen that um, V6 activation kind of changes and they have like an altered sense of subjective point of view or something like that because more things are integrated to the body mm. more than just your actual body. Mm -hmm. Navigation. Mm. Mm. Okay, so now I start to feel like, you know, in for the blind people, they use this device, um, eye cane or something. And mm -hmm. that's only sent um, distance information, mm. right? Mm -hmm. And navigation. 
for the navigation, what kind of information do we need? Distance and direction, that's it. Do we need any other information? Well, I'm probably not the best person to ask because yeah. I have pretty poor sense of okay. spatial. <laughs> okay. But um, yeah, I guess so. Like you, hmm. somehow I feel like, you know, for 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 a, a long term navigation purpose, right? Hmm. You need to have some kind of spatial memory that records your previous direction as like relevant with reference to your current point of view and your current like your body and your current point of view. Mm. I think that's very important. <laughs> mm, mm, mm. Mm. Yeah, the reason why I'm talking about this is uh, based on my experience. So I'm not sure whether you knew it, but you know, I had, um, you know, not disease, but uh, some, you know, problem with my eye called uh, uh, I think la lazy eye or double vision. So basically, this oh, yeah. eye direction is not aligned. It's not. Yeah. yeah. So I have that too. Not mm, so not that severe, but you know, in the end, I could not, you know. Uh, yeah, I just had a problem. I, I couldn't, you know, perceive the distance. Mm. But, you know, still I can, you know, navigate the world. So walk around the city, of course. So I mean, when you say you cannot perceive distance, you're talking about like whether this thing is five meters away or 5.5 meters away, right? You're not talking about like, is this person literally in front of me or like 100 meters away? So I feel like a rough sense of distance is enough for navigation. It's just, okay. yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Not the visual input then, maybe memory or knowledge help me to navigate because it will add some, you know, distance information. I see. Yes. Yeah. Speaking of which, I, I feel like, you know, the, the, the letter is more important because it helps you to have uh, uh, like a overall concept about what kind of space you are currently in and what route you have taken. And with reference to this space and the route where you are, I am really poor at this. That's why I get lost. Mm, <laughs> I cannot I remember, you know, which way I came from. I see. And I find it really difficult to reference a certain point I've been in mm. to where I am now if I cannot see it directly. <laughs> okay, I see. So without that ability, maybe, even with the device, blind people can't explore the world or can navigate themselves in the world. Yes. Mm. Or like they, they kind of, you need to measure the time it takes for them to find the the exit. You know, sometimes you, you can still manage to go to the exit by avoiding all the walls mm -hmm. without remembering. You're just bouncing around and then, you know, somehow you get to the end, right? Mm -hmm. But those... Um, short-term information still help you to, you know, eliminate the possibility of a wall being an exit. So, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I see. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Um, other things. Um. um and yeah. Yeah. You no. No. I just. Yeah, I was just going to say that you know, they did th two experiments. The first one, mm -hmm. the career, me. They wanted to ask whether B6 is important for navigation, whether yeah. its visual experience is necessary to develop the function. That's career. But regarding the experiment two about the body movement on B6, that's mm, it's a little bit unclear to me, to be honest, why they wanted to do that. Uh, I, I, I guess the point they were trying to make 
eventually with two experiments together is that V6 take into account the movement of your body and some kind of sensory input, whether it's mm -hmm. visual or auditory, together construct your point of view with relations to the space. Mm -hmm. But um, I guess the two experiments kind of separately test that, so it's unclear, especially for the second experiment, what the purpose was mm -hmm. that. And you don't know, you know, uh, whether it was body movements that contributes to point of view, mm -hmm. even though navigation and body movements both activate mm -hmm. V6. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And yeah, with regard to that, um, their second experiment tested only sighted individuals. Yeah. So I um yeah I I was wondering why they didn't test this on, you know uh, how do I say it? uh the CB the blind participants, mm -hmm. if they also test on blind participants and found oh V six also activates for the blind participants bodily movements then I'll I'll find it more convincing that uh for both groups regardless of sensory input these things take into account of bodily movements I don't know why they didn't maybe or this is just my guess but you know again the main experiment for them is experiment one and then they maybe review or ask them to do this second experiment mm -hmm. or someone came up this experiment two after finishing experiment one mm -hmm. and then for them it was mm -hmm. not easy to recruit this blind participants so they just you know gave up doing yeah. or maybe the result too obvious for them so they didn't feel any reasons to, you know, do the same experiment for uh, blind people. Mm, I, I, I don't know the reason why. I think the first situation is more probable because you can just imagine that um, people who's blind at birth, you know, they are, they are a very small population, so they probably have a very busy schedule doing different experiments mm -hmm. so you know at the time when they want to do experiment two it's already hard to schedule a time with them so mm -hmm. this kind of things happen mm -hmm. if the the results you know uh between the sighted and blind participants are both that you know the, are the same and they're very obvious then they could have just recruit 10 sighted participants and then 10 uh, blind participants and then just mm -hmm. tell us ah the results are the same but mm -hmm. they didn't mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. um so another thing i wanted to bring up it's actually um not related to this without visual experience part it was actually about visual experience mm -hmm. so the first sentence in discussion tell us that V6 is the motion sensitive area that mostly represents the per peripheral part of the visual field. Mm. And the fact that you know, V6 uh, respond mostly to peripheral visual input and it is implicated in referencing the body position in space and you know, uh, anchor our conscious experience in a particular way. Um, this basically kind of tells us that um, peripheral visual input is a very important part of our visual experience. Um, mm. And that reminds me of, you know, all these arguments about we are actually blind in the periphery or, or like a rich periphery vision is illusory. They probably kind of probe the peripheral vision in the wrong way, right? If mm. you use things that are not related to places, such as like color patches, gabber patches, then people, you know, 
um, because this is not something the visual system expected to have uh, to appear in the periphery, and it's you know the visual system is not good at dealing with these kind of artificial things in the periphery. Then you know of course you wouldn't perform well, and um, that also kind of explain um, one of the claims about um, peripheral. Uh, experience, which is called subjective inflation, um, where they claim that your peripheral experience is actually very poor, mm -hmm. um, but um, you have a false sense of it being very rich. And this can be revealed when you um, do some kind of visual task in the periphery and people ask about your confidence, mm -hmm. even when uh, and your performance is, let's say they pr present the stimulus in the fovea and then present the stimulus in the periphery and then ask you to do the task on both stimulus. Mm -hmm. um, when your performance on the fovea and periphery are the same, you will have a higher confidence about your accuracy when the stimulus is in the periphery. Mm -hmm. I see. They, they use that as uh, a kind of evidence for you have a false sense of a better um, division in the periphery mm -hmm. when you actually don't. Mm -hmm. So the point I try to make is, I, I think people have this kind of so-called illusion is that in everyday life, peripheral vision is very good mm -hmm. you, in face of the naturalistic stimuli. Mm -hmm. And when they say they're very confident about their peripheral visual experience, they're making inference from their everyday experience, right? Mm -hmm. If I can see my, if I can detect my environment so reliably, then of course I can do this well. Mm -hmm. Although they don't because the visual system is not adapted to this kind of stimulus. Mm -hmm. So basically they make an inference from the everyday experience, but this inference fell at this particular task, but it has nothing to do with you know peripheral vision itself being poor. Mm -hmm. mm. I mean, I can easily imagine that you know if you wear glasses with only one small hole at the center, and then ask people to navigate in the city, I think it's super difficult. Yeah, <laughs> right. I think there are there are like. Bots game or something that that actually asks people to wear that kind of glass and play football. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So yeah, yeah. So yeah, in that sense, you know, the even though some people might you know claim that the peripheral experience is not that rich, but you know, it's obviously very important and you know affect our behavior quite a lot. And, even confidence. Yeah, so hey, I agree with you. Yeah. So hmm, okay. Hmm. So do, do you think so there will be differences between two conditions where you wear the grass, the one I said, versus you present the stimuli only at the center, and then the, you know, just, you know, periphery is just blank, dark, or something. So, uh, so I, I feel like my, this is just you no, know, my personal, you know, feeling, but I feel, I feel more or less confidence if I wear that such kind of special grass and then doing, you know, basically the same, you know, task with the, uh, you know, periphery block conditions. Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah, so wearing a glass showing only the phobia part and then the peripheries block out. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. And I mean, obviously, V6 will be less activated because it's most in, in sighted participants, it mostly represent the very peripheral part of the visual view, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. 
and also it's you know it's also like the same region also processes motion information mm -hmm. does this mean like when we ask what we see in the peripheral vision we need to consider in a in a context where people are actually moving around and rather than just sitting there and looking at pictures. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, what I'm trying to say is the proof that the role of this peripheral vision will become more and more important as you move the experiment context, uh, the paradigm from completely static and artificial to more naturalistic where you actually allow people to move around. Mm. 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 Yeah. Um I think what well, yeah, at least you know, I, I guess some you know driving company do that kind of uh, psychophysics experiment really seriously because you know driving car they uh, you know drivers of course pay attention to the Forward, but at the same time, they need to, you know, pay attention to the periphery and the sidewalk, like, you know, just, you know, some maybe cats right in front of the car or something, sometimes. And then that, you know, was a traffic accident. And then not only, of course, not the animal, but also the human self, they are walking. Oh, yeah. Mm. So cats, yeah. like very specific point of caution for you. <laughs> well, yeah, cats. Oh, yeah, in, in Japan maybe cats. Yeah. Yeah, in in Australia it's probably birds, and if you're going on highways, it's kangaroos. Mm. Yeah, kangaroo. Yeah. Mm. So, mm, we might be able to you know, see some link with between these, you know, driving in a psychophysics experiment and this kind of, you know, peripheral rich experience or something. Mm. Mm. Yeah, anyway, do you have anything to add? Yeah, just a very minor point about their results. Okay. Um, in page five, mm -hmm. page five, um, when they talk about um area for court, uh, for blind individuals, um, uh, area V six show a learning effect. Um, where like pre training, there's no difference between the V six activity in mates versus uh control, mm. and while well, after training, uh, V six. Uh, activation are uh, much stronger in navigation versus no navigation condition, right? Mm -hmm. So they call this a learning effect. And then to follow up on this effect, they also um, uh, look at the activation in a few more other regions. And they said, oh, V6 is singularly attributable to this learning effect. Mm -hmm. I don't know, in, in part of its results, it seems to suggest otherwise. So in, in the part where they say area V6A and DVT, mm. they said for right hemisphere DVT, there was no differences in its activation between conditions in pre-training, whereas in post-training session, it shows higher activation for navigation versus control. Isn't that the learning effect in DVT? Like it seems to be in conflict 
it seems to contradict with what they're trying to say here. The hmm? DVT, right hemisphere DVT, RHDVT. Uh, which page? Which page? You said five, but I could not find. Can I share screen? Uh, no. Uh, no. Okay. Okay. Uh, 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 yeah, this... I found it. Yeah, DVT. Yeah, 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 yeah. Cool, 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 cool. Hmm. If you do hear that. That learning effect. Mm. Condition. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Navigation. And also, also left V6A as well. After training, the left D6A area had more activity in, in navigation conditions compared with the control. Mm. Yeah. Isn't that learning? Yeah. So, well, I mean, the effect sizes are much smaller, of course, but um, mm. it's not the same as V6 is you know, single-handedly responsible for this learning effect, right? Mm. Yeah, that's true, yeah. Yeah, I didn't notice that, but yeah, you're correct. Mm. Yeah, it's weird. <laughs> mm. They... I don't. I just don't know what's going on here. Maybe yeah. there's something very important, or in supplementary material somewhere they show something. But yeah, yeah. Or yes. or there's a huge uh, individual variability in this effect compared to the reliable, consistent effect they observe in these states. Mm -hmm. But they didn't mention anything. Also, they only include the figure for. Uh, A1, which you know definitely did not show any learning effect. Mm. Like, yeah, you know, it's not attributed to the A1, and then it's also not attributed to you know these regions, although there are effects there. It's mm. kind But I, I guess, you know, the V6A and DVT, according to uh, them, is close to V6, so, uh, yeah. It's like I, a, some kind of correlation. Yeah, I, I guess so, yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, but again, I'm not sure about detail of this. Yeah, need to check the supplementary or some you know method or yeah somewhere. Okay. Anyway. That's it for today. Yeah. Mm. Okay, then let's finish discussion. Now see you. Yeah. Bye bye.